Good evening, everyone. Good evening, everyone. It's a blessing for me to be here with you on this Sunday. And the Lord has been good. Um, just this week, I had the privilege of being out in uh, Bogota, Colombia. And some of you may know that Pope Francis was visiting out there. And over two million people from throughout South America came over there to see El Papa as he was in the land. And we shared tens of thousands of truth-filled literature and DVDs with those that were present at that time. It was immense blessing. Uh, many great controversies went out. Many truth-filled DVDs went out. And the people were hungry to receive the message. It was so, they were so uh, excited about receiving this literature that at one point the people were mobbing me to grab the books and they were grabbing me the police literally had to step in and control the crowd it was an immense blessing and then as we left from there we went over to the city of New York we were working out in Manhattan and we gave out many copies of the great controversy there as well and brothers and sisters God is calling us to do a work, and he's calling us to do that work immediately. I want to say that one more time. God is calling us to do a work, and he's calling us to do that work immediately. We have left off the work that God has called us to do for all too long. And in his love and in his kindness, God is sending signs in the land to awaken us to the reality of the nearness of the second coming of Jesus Christ. And unfortunately, because we've had the truth in our possession for so long, I believe in some sense we've begun to despise the truth that we know so well. Because we're so familiar with it. You know the old adage, familiarity breeds contempt. Have you ever heard that before? Oh, no one's in the church with me. I'm here by myself. Have you ever heard that adage before, familiarity breeds contempt? I believe that's the way that we are dealing with the Word of God. But I pray that as we study the Word of God throughout this week, even beginning this evening, that this contempt that we have had for the present truth will be removed from our hearts and that fire that the Lord once ignited in our souls will once again be rekindled. So as it is my tradition, as you know, I'm familiar with many faces that are here. As it is my tradition, before I open the Word of God, I believe that there are two things that I will never forsake doing when I stand before the people of the Lord. And that is, number one, I ask you to please pray for yourself. Every time the Holy Scriptures are opened, I believe the Holy Spirit is at hand to open our understanding and to lead and direct us into all truth. Brothers and sisters, we need the Spirit of God more now than ever before. We're told by the servant of the Lord that we pray all too little for the Spirit of the Lord. That cannot be our situation today. Amen? Amen? And so if it is your desire to spend the next few moments of time profitably, I counsel you simply pray for the Spirit of the Lord. Ask Him to be your teacher. Ask Him to impress your heart as to what you need to do in your personal experience with the Lord for such a time as this. And please pray for me as well that I'll be used as an agent in the hand of the Lord for his glory, for his will to be accomplished. So I'm going to kneel at this time. I invite you to kneel with me. And let's just take the next few moments, 60 seconds to be precise. And I'm asking you simply to pray. Ask the Lord to talk to your heart. If there are some sins that you have come into the courts of the Lord with, pray and ask him to cleanse your heart that you might be ready to receive what he desires to pour into your souls. When you hear my voice, I'll be closing us out in prayer. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for the blessing of peace. 
Lord, we know that this short window of opportunity, these hours of probation, they are rapidly fleeing away. But now we have some peace. Now we have opportunity to acknowledge Jesus Christ as the Lamb of God that died and rose again to take away our sins. And we want to avail ourselves of this opportunity. Lord, we come in the name of Jesus pleading his merits, acknowledging him as our great high priest. And we ask that you would forgive us of our sins. That you'd wash us thoroughly of all of our unrighteousness, all of our iniquity, everything that will separate our souls from being united as one with you. Please cleanse us thoroughly. We ask for the choice gift of your Holy Spirit. I love the words of Jesus. He said, if our parents being evil know how to give good gifts unto their children, how much more would you, our Father, which is in heaven, give the Holy Spirit unto them that ask him? Father, I ask that you would bless us with the Comforter, the Spirit of Truth, that he would convict us of sin, that he would convict us of righteousness, that he would convict us of judgment, that he would lead us into all truth and show us things to come. And that as we see ourselves and the times in which we live for what they truly are, we would all make the decision to fall on the rock and be broken. Let Christ be exalted in our hearts. May every word this evening, Lord, proceed from your throne. And we thank you for hearing our prayers, for your loving kindness, and for this renewed opportunity to repent and receive the kingdom of God. For all this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to invite you to open your Bibles. We're going to go to the book of Revelation chapter 7. Revelation chapter 7, familiar chapter in the Bible, I believe, to the majority of us in here. Once again, we're going to the book of Revelation, the seventh chapter, and we're going to begin at verse 1. Revelation chapter 7, beginning at the first verse. Please, when you arrive there, just let me know by saying amen. Revelation chapter 7, beginning at verse 1. The Bible tells us here, And after these things I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, so the winds would not blow on the earth, nor on the sea, nor on any tree. And I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice unto the four angels, unto whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea, saying, Hurt not the earth, neither the sea, nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. Brothers and sisters, this, though it is contained in the book of Revelation, it is not symbolic. Literally, at this very time, God has set four angels at the four corners of the planet Earth to hold back the winds of strife, the winds of destruction, from calamity breaking forth on planet earth. And the word of God lets us know that these angels will only hold this position of authority for a probationary period of time. Why? We are told that another angel comes ascending from the east, possessing the seal of the living God. He cries unto the other four angels saying, hurt not the earth, neither the sea, nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. That lets me know, that lets all of us know that when the sealing work is completed, then what will happen next? The four winds will be let loose. And we are told clearly by the servant of the Lord that the things that we see taking place right now on planet Earth are harbingers, literal signs, indicating that this event is getting ready to take place, the letting loose of the four winds. I want to say that one more time. 
Brothers and sisters, we're not just seeing freak outbreaks of nature, and we're not just seeing men manipulating Mother Nature. What we are seeing are the signs indicating the nearness of the second coming of Jesus Christ, but prior to that, the letting loose of the four winds. If you're with me, say amen. We are told in the book Christian Service, page 52, paragraph 1, even now, the restraining spirit of God is being removed from this world. Hurricanes, storms, tempests, fire and flood by land. Are you following so far? Fire and flood by land and by sea. All these following one another in quick succession. Scientists seek to explain these. The signs thickening around us, telling us of the near approach of the Son of God, are attributed to any other than the true cause. Men cannot discern the sentinel angels holding back the winds until the servants of God are sealed. But when God shall bid the angels to loose the winds, then shall we see scenes of strife such as no pen can picture. All the hurricanes, hold on a second. Are we seeing hurricane, storm, flood? Are we seeing these things following one another in rapid succession? We see Harvey, we see Irma, Jose. In the middle of this, earthquake in Mexico. As these are transpiring, Fires burning on the West Coast, and the people of God are sitting down idly, comforting ourselves that all things continue as they are. Brothers and sisters, we are living in the end. Do you really believe that? How many people here believe that we're living in the last days? Let me ask a better question. How many people here are living like we're in the last days? Because every time the question is posed, are we living in the last days? From nominal to ultra conservative, everyone says amen. But how many are actually living as if Jesus is soon to come? Brothers and sisters, don't let anybody deceive you into believing that what we're seeing right now are just freak outbreaks of nature. These things are just occurrences of nature. These things are nothing new. Brothers and sisters, these are the signs. Matter of fact, if you just look a little bit further, same book, Christian Service, page 52, paragraph 3, it says many want to say that these things are just capricious. Outbreaks of nature. But the reality is that these are among the agencies which God is using to awaken men and women to a sense of their danger. Have you been awakened to a sense of your danger? Have you been awakened to a sense of the fact that probation is getting ready to close and you may not be ready to stand in the presence of a holy God without an intercessor? Has that reality taken hold of your mind as of yet? Has it caused you to make some decisions that you are going to begin to conduct yourself and the fears of your whole household in a totally different way than you were a week ago? Has that reality, has that truth taken hold of you as of yet? If it hasn't, brothers and sisters, you do realize that you're asleep. God wants a people that are awake, understanding, discerning the times. Matter of fact, turn your Bible with me. We're going to Jeremiah chapter 8. Where are you going now? Jeremiah, the 8th chapter. We're going to begin now at verse 7. Jeremiah, the 8th chapter, looking at verse 7. The Bible declares here, Yea, the stork in the heaven knoweth her appointed times, and the turtle and the crane and the swallow observe the time of their coming, but my people know not the judgment of the Lord. Do you understand what this is talking about here? You know, there are certain creatures within nature 
that when specific seasons come around, they go into hibernation or brumation. Have you ever heard of that before? They know that when the seasons change, they can discern the, they can discern the signs that tell them it's time for me to go into hiding. Are you following? And what's, more, what's even more intriguing about this particular verse of scripture is that when you do a little bit of research concerning these animals, you'll find out that some of them are hot-blooded and some of them are cold-blooded. So you have these hot-blooded beasts and these cold-blooded beasts that can discern the signs in nature that dictate to them it's time for you to go into hiding, but God's lukewarm Laodicean church doesn't discern the time of judgment. You mean to tell me that even the brute beast is more intelligent than the people of God? You know, animals can tell when storms are coming. <laughs> you know animals can tell when storms are coming, don't you? When storms start brewing, the birds start flying in one direction. Matter of fact, there was one news report for the people in the islands. They told them, just let your horses loose because they know how to protect themselves better than you do. The animals can discern the approach of the storm. Have God's people played around with sin and practiced iniquity to such an extent that we have degraded ourselves below the intellect of brute beasts? Can we not tell that a storm is coming? The Bible tells us, look with me, we're going to the book of Isaiah chapter 26. Isaiah chapter 26. Isaiah the 26th chapter, and now we're looking at verse 20. The Bible tells us here, Come my people, enter thou into thy chambers, and shut thy doors about thee. Hide thyself, as it were, for a little moment, until the indignation be overpassed. God is telling us, Come! And do what? Hide ourselves in the chambers and shut the doors about us. Matter of fact, when you look at that word come from the original Hebrew from whence it was translated, it doesn't just simply mean make an approach. It literally means to run. Run and get into the chambers. Shut the doors about you. Hide yourselves, as it were, for a little moment until the indignation be overpassed. That word chambers, in the original Hebrew from whence it was translated, it means come, run into the apartment. Run into the inner apartment and shut the doors about you and hide yourself as it were for a little moment until the indignation is overpassed. God is counseling us that it's time that we stop dragging our feet and taking the truth for granted. It's time to run and get into the apartment. Now what apartment is the Bible speaking of here? What apartment is God speaking of here? I mean obviously we need to know where this apartment is because God's not going to tell us to go to a destination and we don't know where that destination is located. Where is God telling us to hide ourselves in this inner apartment? I want you to open your Bibles. Go with me to Psalm chapter 27. Psalm the 27th chapter, we're going to look at the 5th verse there. Once again, Psalm chapter 27, and we're looking now at the 5th verse. Where are God's people supposed to be running to as of now? The Bible says in verse 5, For in the time of trouble he shall hide me in his pavilion, in the secret of his tabernacle shall he do what? He shall set me up upon a rock. God has a hiding place for his people. And where is that hiding place? His pavilion, the tabernacle. What's the tabernacle, brothers and sisters? Come on now, talk to me. I know I have some, some Seventh-day Adventists at least in here. Where is the tabernacle, brothers and sisters? The sanctuary. Is there an apartment where God wants his people to be fleeing into at this time? Let's make it clear, whatever this apartment is, it's an apartment where God can set us up on the rock. Now, what or whom is that rock? Go with me, 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Let's make it clear from the word of God. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. 
in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, looking at verse 3, in speaking of the wilderness wandering of the children of Israel, the Bible says, looking at 1 Corinthians chapter 10, looking at verse 3, and did all eat the same spiritual meat, verse 4, and did all drink the same spiritual drink, for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. God is counseling us to run and hide ourselves in the sanctuary because it's only there where he can set us up on the rock. It's only there where we can be established in Jesus Christ. Question, is Jesus Christ in the outer court? Is Jesus Christ in the holy place? Matter of fact, quickly, go with me. Romans chapter 8 and verse 34. Let's make it plain. Romans 8 and verse 34. In Romans chapter 8 and verse 34, familiar scripture, I believe, to many of us here. Speaking of this Jesus Christ, whom is the rock, whom God wants us to be established in, hidden in, at this time, the Bible says, who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that has died, yea, rather, that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God who also maketh intercession for us. So Jesus Christ, the rock, is now making intercession for each one of us, and we know he's doing this work in the heavenly sanctuary. But now go with me to Hebrews chapter 8. Hebrews chapter 8. Once again, brothers and sisters, I counsel you, despise not the truth, though you may be familiar with it, because many of us know things that we're not practicing. The word of God clearly declares, speaking of the present truth in 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 12, Wherefore I will not be negligent to put you always in remembrance of these things, though ye don't know them. The Bible says, though ye already know them and be established in the present truth. You cannot be established in the present truth if you are not continually rehearsing that present truth, that it might become a practical aspect of your literal existence are you following right now we know the truth we have an intellectual understanding of it but an intellectual knowledge of the truth will never have you sealed in the truth to be sealed is to be intellectually and experimentally settled in the truth and most of us Oh, most of us, we have the intellectual aspect covered backwards and forwards. Experimentally, we have not even begun the first step. Bible says in Hebrews chapter 8, beginning at verse 1, Now of the things which we have spoken, this is the sum. We have such an high priest which is set at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens, a minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle which the Lord pitched and not man. So we do understand that Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, the rock of our salvation, he is at the right hand of the throne of God and he is now interceding on each one of our behalves. Am I correct on this? Now, where is he at? Is he in the outer court? You said no. Is he in the holy place? You say what? So where is he? The Bible is clear in Daniel chapter 7. Go with me beginning at verse 9. Because when we look at the symbolism in the sanctuary, and you remember in the south of the sanctuary, there's the candlesticks in the holy place. In the north, we had the table of showbread with two crown moldings symbolizing the throne of God. Was the throne of God at one point located in the holy place, so to say? Yea or nay? According to the symbolism given to us in the Old Testament sanctuary system, the answer is yes. But Daniel chapter 7 and verse 9 lets us know that there would be a transition, a work, a move that would take place in the sanctuary. The word of God tells us there, I beheld till the thrones were cast down. The word cast down means set up in place. And the ancient of days did sit whose garment was white as snow and the hair of his head as the pure wool. His will. His throne was as the fiery flame and his wheels as the burning fire. A fiery stream issued and came forth before him. Thousands, thousands ministered unto him. And ten thousands times ten thousand stood before him. The judgment was what? 
set, the books were open. Now I have Seventh-day Adventists in here, so I'm not going to act like I'm not speaking to the people of God. Did the work of judgment take place in the holy place? Where does the work of judgment take place? In the most holy place. And the word of God tells us, come, run. Run into the chambers and shut the doors about you. Brothers and sisters, who is telling us to run into the chambers? Man or God? If God is counseling us to run into the chambers so that we can be set up on the rock, it's because we can't be in the chambers. Is God going to counsel you to go someplace where you're already at? God's going to tell you to go someplace where you're already located. That lets me know that many of us know where Christ is. Many of us know where the work is going forward, but we're not there. We have a knowledge of it. We're acutely aware of the work that's going on in the courts of heaven, but we have not by faith embraced it. And God is now telling us it is time to run into the most holy place. You can't drag your feet any longer. You can't walk into, you need to run and experience what Jesus Christ is standing as our high priest to accomplish in our work, in our lives right now. And that is the total cleansing of our sins. It's time to run. Because only those who run into the innermost apartment of the sanctuary will be set up on the rock to stand in the time of trouble when the four winds are let loose. Brothers and sisters, we have to be set up on the rock. What does it necessitate for us to be set up on the rock? Go with me to the book of Matthew chapter 7. Very familiar words spoken by the mouth of Jesus Christ that we'll look at at this point in time but we need to consider them intimately practically for ourselves the word of God says in Matthew chapter 7 looking at verse 24 therefore whosoever heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them I will liken him unto a wise man which built his house upon a rock. Did Jesus say that he will liken the wise man that built his house upon a rock unto the man that hears his words alone? It's sufficient to hear the words of God and then you're the wise man that built your house upon the rock. Is that what the word of God says? It says the man that hears the word of God and doeth them. That word doeth, when you look at it in its context, it doesn't simply mean that this individual hears the word of God and at one point in time applies it to his life, but it means this individual hears the word of God and he keeps it, he abides in it, he continues in it. This individual is as if he has built his house firmly upon a rock. Most of us have mobile home religion. You're not hearing me. You like to be on the rock, but then you quickly shift onto the sand. God is looking for a people that will do his words. Abide in me and I in you, Jesus said continually dwelling in Christ by faith. That is the experience that we need to stand in the hour of the storm. The word of God is clear in verse 25 because when the rain descends on that house that's built on the rock and when the floods arise on that house that's built upon the rock and the winds begin to blow on that house that's built upon the rock, the Bible says it can beat on that house as much as it wants but that house will not fall. Why? Because it's set up on the rock.
And it is good that we desire to be built on the rock. It is good for us to come to church to hear messages. It's good for us to come to Sabbath school and have discussions that spark the intellect, that encourage us to have spiritual inclinations. But those things are not sufficient to build on the rock. Matter of fact, please look with me quickly, quickly. Go with me to the book of Luke. Luke chapter 6. Matthew, Mark, Luke chapter 6. Because in Luke chapter 6, in Luke chapter 6, Jesus himself lets us know what type of effort must be exerted on our behalf by faith that we indeed might securely have our houses built upon the rock. Begin at verse 46 with me. And why call ye me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? Verse 47, whosoever cometh to me and heareth my sayings and doeth them continues in them. I will show you to whom he is like. He is like a man which built an house and digged what? Deep and laid the foundation on a rock. What was necessary for the wise man to lay the foundation of his existence? What was necessary for him to build on the rock? What did he have to do? He had to dig, but he had to dig deep. Some people say, well, brother, I study the word of God. I know the 2300 days. Brother, I study the word of God. God has shown me things that no other human eye has ever seen from the word of God before. I dig deep into the word of God. Do you think that's what God is talking about? Just digging, digging, digging into the word of God. Just digging, digging into the word of God. You know, when you look at this whole issue of digging and building a house and you begin to consider not how we do construction today, but how they did construction then, you have to consider the soil and realize that, you know, there are different levels to the soil. You do know that, right? There's different levels to the earth. If you dig down about three levels in the earth, you'll hit to the sand. Did you know that? So some of us, we like to dig, but we'll go just as deep. As the sand but you have to go about four to five levels down before you begin to hit on rock so the person that's building on the sand it's not that this individual is not seeking a relationship with Jesus Christ it's not that they don't have a desire to go deeper in their experience but they don't want to go deep enough there's still something between their souls and the rock are you following right now? There are still things that we're holding on to in our lives that are keeping us from firmly being established in Jesus. Brothers and sisters, it's not good enough that you say yes. You know, I've, I've, you know, many of us when we come to Jesus, we say I've digged, you know. I've digged, I've given up the liquor, I've digged. I've digged, I've given up the movies, I've digged. I've digged, I've given up the cursing, I've digged. What about your bitter attitude? What about your unforgiving spirit? What about your jealousy and your backbiting? What about your pride? What about all those secret sins that no one in the church can discern, but the eye of God beholds continually and it troubles his heart because you don't want to surrender it? If you feel secure and your house is on the sand, I want you to know it's time to fall on the rock. Because the only way that we can weather the storm is if we are established on the rock. Nothing can be beaten. Nothing can be between our soul and our Savior. Nothing. 
Whatever that idol is, whatever that coveted sin is, God is pleading with us now to place it on the altar. That's why he's saying, run. Run into the inner apartment. You know something? On the Day of Atonement, and I know all of you are familiar with what I'm getting ready to share. Any person that had unconfessed sins, they were cut off from the congregation of God. What was necessary for one by faith to enter into that Day of Atonement experience? What was necessary? They had to acknowledge their what? None who... None who refused to acknowledge their sin could find themselves by faith embracing the experience that the high priest was seeking to secure for them. And that was the cleansing of their souls. So when God is telling us to run into the apartment, he's not simply telling us, to quickly acknowledge what's going on. He's saying quickly, repent, acknowledge your sins and turn away from them because I'm getting ready to take off my high priestly garments and when I do, it's over. Brothers and sisters, you do realize that in the wake After every big storm, like what we have right now, every massive hurricane that rips through a vicinity, what follows shortly thereafter? Let me ask you something. When a hurricane sweeps through an area, tears down houses, tears down buildings, destroys supermarkets, destroys farmland, do you not have famine that comes thereafter? Am I making something up right now? Is this not why they tell people, you better make sure. Is this not why people fight for water and rations in supermarkets when they know that the storm is coming? Because shortly after the storm comes the famine. Bible tells us in the book of Amos, go with me quickly. Amos. Amos chapter 8. Amos chapter 8, looking at verse 11. In Amos 8, looking at the 11th verse, the Bible says, Behold, the days come and save the Lord that I will send a famine in the land, not a famine for bread, nor a thirst for water, but of hearing the words of the Lord. We have been told already that even now, as we see these events unfolding, what is taking place? The restraining spirit of God is being removed from our world. When the spirit of God is removed from planet Earth, will you hear the truth anymore? Will the everlasting gospel be being preached anymore? Will God be pleading with you to confess and forsake your sins anymore? The answer to all three is a resounding no. The famine is coming, brothers and sisters. How do we know? Because all of the harbingers, all of the signs are thickening in the land, relaying to us the information that the storm is on its way. Don't you think that you need to be preparing for the time of famine? He says the famine is coming in the land, not a famine for bread, nor a thirst for water, but of hearing the words of the Lord. The word of God goes on to say in verse 3, verse 12, And they shall wander from sea to sea, from the north even to the east. They shall run to and fro to seek the word of the Lord, but shall not find it. When the famine touches down on planet earth, and let us not be deceived, it is coming. Men will begin to wander from sea to sea. Revelation chapter 17 and verse 15 lets us know that the sea is a symbol of nations, multitudes, kindreds, and tongues. People will begin to go from nation to nation. The very funds that you refuse to put into the work of the living God, you will put into a plane ticket to hear the word of God. 
People will literally travel from continent to continent. Can I hear a message of truth? Something that will bring some type of comfort to my soul. Literally willing to travel the globe to hear the word of the Lord. The Bible says you won't hear a word of consolation. You will not find it. When men exhaust their resources in trying to find some place where they can hear a preacher that will give to them a message that will stir their souls. The Bible says next they'll go and they'll run to the north. Why are they going to the north? You know why they're going to the north. Talking to good sanctuary understanding Seventh-day Adventists in this room, aren't I? The Bible tells us in the book of Psalms chapter 48 beginning at verse 1. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised in the city of our God, in the mountain of his holiness. Beautiful for situation. If you're there with me, say amen. Beautiful for situation is the joy of the whole earth. Is what? I'll wait for you to get there. Psalm 48, beginning at verse 2. Please, when you arrive there, say amen. You know, I heard the elder say something earlier, shortly before, as he was actually introducing me. Some of you didn't say amen, but I realize you should have said amen. He says, you can't live in Dallas and not be a football fan. You get excited for nonsense. We get into the word of God, you can't even say amen to the truth. Can't even open your Bible to read something that will help us. Un Brothers and sisters, this is a serious time in which we're living in. And the words that are coming out of my mouth, I'm not just trying to sling the word of God around, trying to hurl stinging rebukes at people. Brothers and sisters, we need to be engaged in the truth like no other time. The Bible says in Psalm 48 and verse 1, Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised in the city of our God, in the mountain of his holiness, beautiful for situation, the joy of the whole earth, is Mount Zion on the sides of the north, the city of the great king. In the sides of the north, what do we have? We have the city of the great king. If we have the city and the king, we have to have the throne. If that's true, say amen. The same way as we saw earlier in the sanctuary in the north was the table of showbread, which was a symbol of the presence of God, which was a symbol of the throne of God. Brothers and sisters, the throne of God is located in the north. And the word of God tells us that when the famine touches down on planet earth, people will begin to flee to the north to seek for sustenance. Why are they going to the north? Because they're fleeing to the throne of God. Why are they fleeing to the throne of God? Go with me quickly. We're looking to the book of Hebrews chapter 4. Hebrews the fourth chapter. Hebrews the fourth chapter. The Bible tells us in Hebrews the fourth chapter why men and women at that critical hour will then deem it of the utmost importance to run to the north. The Bible tells us in Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 14, Seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast the, our profession. Why? Verse 15, For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of Grace, is that not the throne of God? Where is it located? In the sides of the north. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace that we might obtain mercy and grace to help in our time of need. Now as the famine is in the land and peace has fleed from the hearts of men and they realize like never before they have a time of need, then they'll begin to seek a savior. You see, they will have heard the message of Jesus, the great high priest, interceding at the throne of God on their behalf. They will have heard the message of the investigative judgment because we are told that before the end comes, this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world for a witness. All men and women will have the opportunity to lay hold upon the high priest by faith. 
but many because we're comfortable in houses and lands and jobs and seeking after men and women and education and every other temporal thing that will not minister to your eternal salvation, you don't realize your great need. But when your soul senses its dearth because although you may not have heard the voice of the high priest declare it, your heart will sense it that the declaration in the courts of heaven has gone forth, forth, it is finished. He that is unjust, let him be unjust still. And he that is filthy, let him be filthy still. And he that is righteous, let him be righteous still. And he that is holy, let him be holy still. And you realize the harvest is past and I'm not saved. Then you'll want a high priest. You'll want grace and mercy because you know your time of need. Brothers and sisters, let me tell you something. You know what? The Holy Spirit is pricking our hearts day after day after day in some way, shape, or fashion. He's trying to get our attention. I know it because God is a God of love and the word of God clearly declares that God is not slack concerning his promises as some men count slackness, but he is long suffering towards us word. He is beckoning and he is pleading with us to surrender our love of fashion, surrender our love of meat and drink that will not minister to having a clear mind that can grab hold of spiritual truths that will not only fit us for eternity, but will fit us to be vessels to be used to preach this message to lighten this world with the glory of God. He's speaking to us. Every man and woman, young and old, he is speaking. But still, many of us refuse to realize that right now is our time of need. But you know when we'll realize we have a need? When Jesus concludes his high priestly ministry. Because the Bible lets us know that when the transition takes place in the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary, when Jesus Christ no longer is interceding on our behalves, something will begin to take place that will cause men to realize they have need. Revelation chapter 15 and verse 8, quickly with me. Revelation chapter 15, looking at verse 8. The Bible speaks of what will happen in that hour when Jesus Christ concludes his high priestly ministry and it says, and the temple was filled with smoke from the glory of God and from his power. And no man was able to enter the temple till the seven plagues of the seven angels were fulfilled. An hour is coming when the temple of God will be filled with smoke and in that hour the word of God says no man will be able to enter into the temple. And if no man can enter into the temple, that means even the man Christ Jesus won't be in the temple. If you're with me, say amen. amen. Because the Bible clearly states in 1 Timothy 2 and verse 5, For there is one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. He stands there as our divine, glorified human representative. Are you following right now? But when the declaration is made, it is finished. When the censer is casted down, he will remove the high priestly garments. And when the man Christ Jesus steps out, every man that prays will find no entrance in. Until the seven plagues have finished their work. This is the reason why people now have an acute sense of their need. Because they're experiencing the plagues. You didn't understand your need when you were looking beautiful in the mirror, but when sores are covering your body, then you'll understand your need. You didn't understand your need when the rent was paid or the mortgage was paid, but when hell is destroying all that you own, then you'll understand your need. 
when the comforts are removed because the Spirit of God is removed, then men and women will understand their need. But the call, the cry has already gone forth from the sanctuary. It is finished. The plagues are falling now. We are not looking at an event in the scripture that are many years. This is not something that we're going to wait another millennia for. It's coming. It is rapidly approaching. Matter of fact, Testimonies, Volume 8, page 312, it says, A storm is coming, relentless in its fury. Are we prepared to meet it? We should not say the perils of the last days are soon to come upon us. Already they have begun. We are not looking for a far off event. It is coming like a steam train rolling at us. Brothers and sisters, we need to prepare for the storm now. And there is only one preparation that will avail anything. It's falling on the rock, Christ Jesus. It's time to repent of those sins. It is time to make things right with the spouse, with the brother or the sister in the church. It is time for us to confess and forsake our sins and to begin to move forward in the light that God in his loving kindness has, has faithfully been shining on our paths. If we say we have faith, let our works now declare our faith. Because the plagues are coming. Because the famine is coming. And people are going to pray. And they will find no comfort when they pray. And so they will then turn their attention from the throne of God. And the Bible tells us in the book of Amos chapter 8 and verse 12. They will then go to the east. Why are they going to the east? You know why they're going to the east. Because Revelation chapter 7 tells us that the sealing message came from the east. Why would they go to those that are sealed? Go with me. Chapter in the Bible that many of our mothers, our godly mothers, godly fathers, told us memorize in the days of our youth. Look with me, Psalm chapter 91. Where are you going right now? The Bible says in Psalm the 91st division, Psalm, the 91st division, beginning at verse 1, the word of God says, He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge, my fortress, my God, and Him will I trust. Surely He shall deliver thee from the snare of the fowler and from the noisome pestilence. He shall cover thee with His feathers, and under His wings shalt thou trust. His truth shall be thy shield and thy buckler. Let's just go to verse 7. A thousand shall fall at thy side. Stop for a second. I want you to understand that what we're looking at here in Psalm chapter 91 is the experience of the seal. This is the experience of those that run into the chambers and shut the doors about them. A thousand shall fall at thy side and ten thousand at thy right hand, but it shall not come nigh thee. Only with thine eyes shalt thou behold and see the reward of the wicked, because thou hast made the Lord, which is my refuge, even the most high thy habitation, there shall no evil befall thee, neither shall any plague come nigh thy dwelling. That is why people will run to the east. Because they'll see a people in this world that don't have sores on them like they do. A people that are not experiencing the plagues and they'll go to them and they'll say, hold on, my children have sores, your children. What is it that you have that I don't give me what you have? The same way that the foolish virgins say to the wise, give me of your oil. But what do the wise say to the foolish? Not so. Lest there's not enough for me and you. Go to them that sell and buy for yourself. Did the scripture ever tell us when we look at the parable of the ten virgins that the foolish ever came back with oil? 
how you're going to buy something when there's a famine in the land. Brothers and sisters, the Bible says men and, run will run, men and women will run to and fro from the north to the east. They will go throughout the expanse of the earth to seek a word from God, but they will not find it. That is the time that is shortly to come upon us. God, in his love, is warning us. It is time to run and enter into the experience of the cleansing of our sins. We can no longer continue in this outer court religion. Sinning, 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 sinning. We're just making a circular motion from outside of the sanctuary into the outer court and outside of the sanctuary into the outer court, but never entering into an experience that will establish us in Jesus Christ. He is seeking to lift us up to a higher standard. But before we can go higher, we have to dig deeper. Will you stand in the hour of the storm? And so, in closing, I let God speak to us from the book of Proverbs chapter 1. Beginning at verse 22. In Proverbs chapter 1, beginning at verse 22, the word of God declares, How long, ye simple ones, will ye love simplicity? And scorners delight in their scorning, and fools hate knowledge. Turn you at my reproof. Behold, I will pour out my spirit unto you. I will make my words known unto you, because I have called and ye have refused. I stretched out my hand, but no man regarded. But she said at not all of my counsel and would none of my reproof. I will laugh at your calamity. I will mock when your fear cometh, when fear cometh as desolation and destruction cometh as a whirlwind. When distress and anguish cometh upon you, then shall they call but I will not answer. They will seek me early, but shall not find me. Why? Because they did not choose knowledge. They hated knowledge. And you did not choose the fear of the Lord. But tonight, Once again, in the ears of God's supposed commandment-keeping people, in the ears of those who are supposed to be the remnant, God reiterates the message to us that he has given us to give to the world. Now it is time for us to fear God and give glory to him. For the hour of his judgment is indeed come. Every head bowed and every eye closed. Brothers and sisters, it is a solemn message for myself. As I see the things that are taking place in the world today, I cannot foolishly look at these things and say in myself there is nothing to startle or alarm in all that is transpiring the voice of God is speaking and his words to us are run 
it is time to get into the most holy place and to stand on the rock. The Lord is calling us into this experience once again this evening, as he has done many a time before. The question is, will we respond this evening differently from how we have done in times past? If it is your desire this night to say, Lord, though many things I have heard this evening are not new to my ears, I know you are speaking directly to my heart and you are calling me to surrender my sins, whatever they be, so that when the storm comes, I will be set up on the rock. If it is your desire tonight to recommit your life to building on the rock that you might stand. I want to invite you to come down front this evening because I'd like to say a special word of prayer for you. This is between you and God. Brothers and sisters, pride will kill you more than man. I have one final appeal to make because I know not those all that are under the hearing of my voice. So I ask you to all pray. As you come, not because I call you to come, but because the Lord has called you to come. I ask you to simply pray in your heart. Number one, for God to anchor you in this decision that you have made. And number two, for his spirit to continue to speak. There may be some that are here this night. I know not all that are here. But there may be some, even one, that has not dedicated their life to the service of the Lord. You may be here and you've never given your heart to Christ, or you may be here in a backslidden state and you know it. And tonight the Lord is calling you to give yourself wholly into his hands. He is extending to you the opportunity to be a child of the kingdom of God. The decision is yours to make. This night, if you desire to say, Lord, I want to surrender my heart. I want to give myself to you. I want to die to my old life of sin. And I want the power of your spirit to reign in my life that I might walk in the newness of life. If it is your desire to receive Bible studies that you might be prepared for baptism. Or you know that you stand in a predicament where you need to experience re-baptism. Whatever your situation may be. If the Lord is calling you to make one of these decisions at this time. I simply invite you to raise your hand. Is there anyone here? that needs to make that decision tonight? If so, harden not your heart. And without any further ado, let us pray and ask God to seal up our decisions. Father, we thank you. We thank you that you are not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. We thank you that you have not left us in darkness because there are many in this world right now that are confused. They are terrified and troubled. Lord, many not far, just hours from where we are kneeling right now, they are totally confused about what the future holds for them because they have lost everything that they have lived their lives up until this point to secure. Perhaps on the brink of suicide because the investment of their existence is in this world. But in your love and in your mercy, for reasons we know not of, 
You have blessed us to have a knowledge of eternal truth that causes us to look beyond the here and now into eternity. That tells us not to think of what we shall eat or what we shall drink or wherewithal we shall be closed, but to put first the kingdom of God and your righteousness. You've called us to lay up our treasures in the courts of heaven. But Lord, you have also caused us to realize once again this evening that these great treasures that you have made available through the sacrifice of your son can only be secured by us falling on the rock and being broken. This night, we acknowledge our need of a thorough cleansing. We acknowledge that we need to have, not an outer court experience, but a most holy place experience. We invite you anew to be the Lord of our lives. And we pray for renewed strength to deny self moment by moment and to bear the cross of Jesus. And for others that you may have been prompting to make even, even further dedication of their life this evening. But for one reason or another, they did not answer that appeal. I pray for your spirit to continue to trouble their hearts until they find safety in Jesus. Thank you for listening to us, for loving us, and for doing everything to deliver us. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.